My name is Ananya and I'm the Executive Director at the Regent Park Film Festival. Before we begin, I'd like to honor and acknowledge the original caretakers of this land. The Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the New Credit, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. We make this acknowledgement as a touchstone in our process of thinking through what it means to live on colonized land, and as a developing expression of our solidarity with our indigenous brothers and sisters. On behalf of Real Canada and the Regent Park Film Festival, we're very pleased to bring you the special screening of The Skin We're In as part of National Canada Film Day 150. As part of the National Canada, Festi National Canada festivities Real Canada has organized, we're one of 1,700 screenings of Canadian films taking place in every corner of this country. By that count, everyone in this room and the next one uh, is helping make this the world's largest film festival ever. I want to thank Real Canada for all of their incredible work in making these screenings possible and for inviting us to be part of another wonderful year. I also want to thank Cineplex for hosting us and offering us this amazing venue. I want to tell you a little bit about the Regent Park Film Festival. We are located just down the street uh, on Dundas at the Daniel Spectrum. We offer free screenings and programming all year round with our annual film festival happening in November. So to check out what's happening next with us, uh, visit our website at regentparkfilmfestival.com. Before we ask you to turn off your phones, we want to give, you, give anyone on social media a chance to tweet or post uh, to say something like, it's hashtag can film day. Uh, and I'm celebrating with at Regent Park Film and at Real Canada. I think all the hashtags are being posted up there, so I, I won't spell them. Uh, the Skin We're In uh, is a very special uh, screening for us. It's a very special piece for us to screen. It's part of our ongoing discussion at the Regent Park Film Festival on issues of anti-black racism and community building. Following the screening will be a discussion with Desmond Cole and filmmaker Charles Officer, moderated by Lou Gasfaha. Uh, Lou is a Toronto storyteller, filmmaker, and activist. Her work uh, has been showcased at festivals in Toronto, Montreal, and Berlin, and she's currently directing the documentary Freedom School about the Black Lives Matter Toronto summer program for young freedom fighters. Before we begin the film, we're going to show uh, a short pre-show that the National Canada Film Day 150 team has put together for us and everyone participating across the country. And please stick around after the, after the film for our Q&A with Lou, Desmond, and Charles. And now I'd like to call up Charles, who's wearing many hats today uh, as our filmmaker, uh, a board member uh, of Real Canada, and uh, as someone who calls Regent Park home. So I'd like to welcome him up. Thank you very much, Regent Park Film Festival. Um, this is a, a very, very special day. It's, it is true. It's, it's, this is like um, the largest film festival that's happening across the globe. Uh, Toronto is, uh, is, is, is just one little piece of this, this amazing country we live in. Um, but um, there's like over 1,700 screenings going on right now that Real Canada has created this initiative to to bring cinema and bring light to Canadian film work um, that that often doesn't get the sort of space that it deserves. So I'm going to commend Jack Bloom and, and Sharon Cotter, who is the relentless individuals who just really, really believe in, in this. And this wouldn't be happening without them and their dedication and their their commitment to Canadian cinema. So um, I want to thank them first and foremost, and I want to thank the CBC for giving the opportunity for us to go out across this country and, and, and this actual, actually like, you know, this continent called North America to kind of bridge gaps and, and uh, look at our community in a, in a broader perspective. And, um, you know, I want to thank um, uh, 90th Parallel and Stuart Henderson and, and uh, uh, Gordon Henderson and Jake Yanowski, who really, really, really did a lot of work on this film to make this possible. It's like films aren't things as you, you know, it's just, it's not just made by one person. So I, I, I you know, when 
there are a lot of people that actually come together to make this deal. I'm sure some of you may know that, some of you may not, but um, <coughs> Cineplex, thank you very much for hosting this. It's, this film was actually made for uh, television broadcast, a one hour, and it's really beautiful to actually see something in a theater. So thank you for coming out. I really, really appreciate it. It's, um, you know, National Can Canadian Film Day 150 is an initiative by Real Canada. Just want to remind you about that. It's a nonprofit organization. So it is uh, run again on energy and love and passion. And um, it brings festivals to Canadian, uh, Canadian films across <laughs> this country all year long to schools. I've been, I've been involved in this uh, this uh, movement um, from its initiation and I've been across this country like um, bringing films to schools and, and, and young folk and exposing them and having these amazing conversations and and uh, it wouldn't happen without people actually believing in this and um, so this day wouldn't be possible without the generous support of the government of Canada and the government of Ontario and so I want to thank them as well and uh, hopefully I'm not boring you all with all of this and um, I want to thank Desmond Cole uh, because without individuals like this in our world, we don't have a fuller perspective of things. And um, it takes courage and it takes bravery and it, and, it, and it takes a lot of energy and it's exhausting and it's emotional. And um, I want to thank him for his commitment and dealing and <laughs> just dealing with me. <laughs> 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 and um, and this is a presentation and I hope you, uh, this is for you, this is for us, and um, hopefully that you'll take something away from this presentation. So, thank you. Um, so I'm Lou, um, and I will be your moderator for the evening. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us on for National uh, Canadian Film Day. And I also wanted to thank Charles and Desmond for coming out and talking to us today. Um, so I'm just going to introduce them. Uh, Charles Officer. There's lights on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, Charles Officer's directing career began with a slate of award-winning short films that premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival and the Sundance Film Festival. His debut feature, Nurse Spider Boy, a lyrical love story about a young boy's faith in magic, premiered at TIFF 08 and garnered 10 Genie nominations at the 30th Awards. His feature documentary debut, Mighty Jerome, was produced by the NFB and won four 2011 Leo Awards and a 2012 Emmy Award for Best Historical Documentary. In 2012, Officer directed Stone Thrower, The Chuck Ely Story, for 90th Parallel Productions, which aired on TSN for the CFL's 100th anniversary. He recently completed directing a variety of episodic television, including the upcoming CBC series, series 21 Thunder, and will premier premiere a feature documentary, Unarmed Versus, produced through the NFB data this year. He is currently in development on a feature and a television mini series Okay. 
Charles, this film has been out for a little over a month. Um, it's had quite a wide distribution, airing on CBC, as well as being available online. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the audience has been engaging with your story? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not laughing because I find it's a funny question. I just, I, I'm, I'm laughing because it's, you know, when, you, when yeah, when you make something, or for me personally, the experience of making something is 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 that you know it's an offering, right? So I've been aware of how reactions have been going, but I, I'm not like social media adapt or in that and all that stuff. But what I have clocked, which I found fascinating, is that I've been snooping on things, <laughs> and uh, and I think there's been definitely positive reactions, and and that's cool. And that's that's amazing. There are people who um, are hungry for for this sort of food, um, and there are those who are very resistant to it. And uh, what I find fascinating is uh, are those individuals. And so, um, actually, I I I, I, I uh, took a lot of screen grabs of of people's responses of things, and eventually, I'm going to make this massive collage. <laughs> Uh, That's going to be interesting. Yeah, it, I think. Um, but it is, uh, even the initiation of this project was a challenge to actually uh, go forth with. And then, you know, at that point of seeing certain reactions across this country um, of certain individuals across this entire country, and I realized that, yeah, man, this was an important piece to make. So regardless of the, the audience's sort of you know, I don't make things for praise or all this stuff. It's, it's because we have something to say and we have something to kind of put out um, and to engage with people. And and the fact that there is an audience uh, or a theater filled with people, this is it. This is a re response. So I'm grateful for that. Great. Um, so Desmond, this uh, you're actually quite used to being in in the spotlight, I imagine. Uh, <laughs> Um, however, this is a pretty emotional story, a uh, pretty personal story for you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the differences between this and what you're used to? I'm still not used to this. Um, I don't know if I ever will be. I, I have to do something really quick, though, if my friend will indulge me. Because there's somebody sitting here who I've been friends with for, oh, how old am I? 25 years? who came, and there's a friend of mine from elementary school. Can, can we get a picture? Like, this is never gonna happen again. Please, I want you to come up. Yeah, this is Teresa, everybody. So like, you know, she gets it, trust me. Um, this has been, it's, it's been, one of the great things about getting to work with Charles, uh, aside from the obvious, which is that Charles is an incredibly talented and compassionate filmmaker, is that um, I know that he had to deal with a lot of the bureaucratic stuff that I usually have to deal with in my day to day which led me to be free to just work, right? So um, Charles and 90th Parallel, you know, Jake and Stuart Henderson are here, and the crew from 90th, they dealt with CBC, they dealt with all the kind of scheduling and, and the deadlines and the travel and the everything, and they really took care of me. It was like, we heard you writing this book, 
we heard you're going to travel to do your research. Can we just follow you? So they really help to facilitate a lot of my work. So in that sense, it's actually a lot easier than a lot of stuff I usually do. Um, but then at the same time, you know, these cats would roll up to my house at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And I got really tired of that pretty fast. You know, so like... Um, that was really... That, I think we just lost a mic. I'll just use... Oh, no, I'm back. Okay. Um, that, was, that was difficult. It was... Working on this was definitely coming into my personal life in ways that... I didn't anticipate. This, this happens to me sometimes, you know, it's like you work on I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just going to use this. Um, <laughs> get away from me, just get away from me. Just, uh, so I'm just going to keep playing with it. Um, yeah, it, it's a personal thing when people follow you around. It's a personal thing when you go around for a whole day with a microphone to the point where you forget that you're mic'd. You know, like... It's a personal thing when you're hanging out in a place where people who work with you or who know you personally see you, and while you're standing there talking to them, you, you catch like out of the corner of your eye a big boom microphone coming up over top of you because these people want to get what you're saying captured. So that was challenging. I don't, I was saying to you earlier, I don't like watching myself on screen. So even doing something like this is crazy for me, but, um, just to see all of you guys here, I can't tell you what it means to me. This means so much. Charles, as a black Canadian filmmaker, can you please tell us why you wanted to tell this story and in this way? <laughs> you know, I born and raised in Toronto. Canada is a, a country I respect and, and care about. My fam my parents are immigrants and came here to, with some specific ideas for their children. And, and uh, through my time, and I'm at a certain vintage now, <laughs> I think I have some things to reflect on and experiences. And, um, and I felt it was important to make this film because I haven't seen it. And, and that's why I do this. It's, it's, I'm not trying to repeat something or regurgitate something that's already been done. I think, you know, as a filmmaker or a storyteller and being, um, you know, documentarians, and I mean that, and you can do that fictionally or non-fictionally, whatever way you choose, that is about your time. And this, this gentleman here is, is my James Baldwin, you know what I mean, for my time. And so to be, um, have the facility or the resources to actually venture out. I know I'm very lucky. I know that there's a lot of uh, talk about, you know, leveling the playing field with diversity and, and cinema and television in this country right now. And uh, right now it's treated as checkboxes rather than it being integrated into what we are about. When we have our, our prime minister talking about us uh, being this incredible multicultural, like, you know, kumbaya, like hanging out sort of tribe it's not exactly true and so this was an opportunity to shed some light to speak some truth and so if you have that opportunity yeah, I, I took it so that's what I did are you hoping that we're gonna see more stories that challenge that narrative are we hoping to are see you hoping it's not even a hope it's 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 imperative it's not a hope this is real this is happening we're doing that that's what we do and we're not gonna stop doing that we're not going to you know take on and do other things to catch a buck or to um because you know making something you never know if it's going to be successful or if it fails so we're not going to spend our time on things that don't stick to the walls of our guts and take that risk because it could possibly fail so we, we're just going to stick to our our mission So Desmond, uh, engaging and challenging racism, particularly anti-black racism, can be really difficult um, in a country where people deny that it is even a problem. How do you continue to do that every single day? 
challenge people who think it's not a problem. How do you gather the strength to continue to challenge people? <laughs> I mean, I, I've started saying this now since this film has come out that, um, you know, it, it's a lot about what people don't see. So there's a stain in my couch at home because I was sitting there one evening and I saw the news report come up that um, that the police officers who had killed Tamir Rice were going to be charged. And I had a pen in my hand and I had been writing and this just flashed up and I was watching it and I literally just dropped this pen and all the ink just bled into my couch as a fine tip pen and there's still a mark there because I was just so shocked. People don't see it when we're sitting alone and we're crying ourselves to sleep about this stuff. They see that and they think, wow, courage and all this stuff. But um, I personally I personally suffer with this every day. It, this is a lifelong process of grieving for ourselves because very few others want to grieve for and with us and want to acknowledge us. Right? So I do a lot of that and people don't see that. Um, but the other thing is that uh, I really think more and more now about our ancestors. I think about people who, in order for this to be possible, had to live their whole lives in bondage, had to live their whole lives hiding who they were, lying about who they were so that somebody wouldn't try to further take advantage of them, people who gave up everything so that the next generation could have, and as the son of immigrants to Canada, it, this is something we understand, right? Like, this is something I definitely understand. So, I think about our ancestors, honestly. I think about how much harder it was for them. And I try to think that I'm carrying on a tradition. And I, it gives me a lot of strength. It gives me a lot of strength because, as I said, like we are in a process of constant grieving and it's like, these clowns want to talk about Black History Month. How dare you? You don't even know what it means. So I am honoring my ancestors by being relentless, by sticking in people's faces and saying I'm not going to allow them to hide and not going to allow them to escape responsibility for the conversations that we collectively need to have. Because at the, at the end of this, this is not really about me getting to vanquish somebody or conquer somebody. Right? It's, it's about coming all together to the table as community. But a lot of us don't want to do that. So the struggle continues. Since you, since you brought up ancestors, I'd like to ask you what you think of the importance of knowing your history, particularly in a country like this where it's not taught. Um, actually, if both of you can even speak on that. Yeah, just quick. So I'm, of the many, many, many books that I could recommend, I'm working on a book right now, and one of the things that I've been trying to do is learn through my, th learn about my history through the scholarship and work of Indigenous writers in Canada. So right now I'm reading a book called Indigenous Rights, W-R-I-T-E-S, by Chelsea Vowell. I've been reading an Inconvenient Indian. Um, you know, I'm reading these books because I, I have to understand the struggle of indigenous people in the land that I inhabit now so that I can also inform my own struggle of what I'm going through. Because our collective fates are wrapped up together. And so I think that that part of our history which has been completely erased by colonialism is as important as, for example, me going to Birchtown or me going to Saskatoon or Red Deer. We have to know how Canada, which we're celebrating this year, everybody, hey, Canada, yay, Canada. 
you know? We gotta know why they think it's such a big deal. And it's not because of sunshine and flowers and rainbows, which is all you ever get out of anybody when you ask them what it means to be a Canadian. It means sunshine and rainbows and flowers. I'd like to have a much more meaningful conversation, and I think that starts with educating myself about the history of indigenous peoples in Canada. Desmond said it, I mean, not to cop out, but I, I honestly feel like, you know, George Eliot Clark said it, it's, 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 you know, knowledge of history is dangerous. You know, you become, and, and we don't do enough of that work, and, and, and that is one of my reflections on these little screen grabs that I've taken, it's like, you know, when Desmond says it's like, in 2016, like, racism is someone's opinion. You know, we need to gather more evidence. We need more of this, we need more of that. It's like, you know, it's not true. You know, so I think um, people can choose to voice their opinions and we have freedom of speech and everyone's allowed to speak. But it's nice when you inform yourself and have a little bit of like, you know, backstory to what your your statement is. And, and, and we constantly have to do the work. No one's gonna do it for you. So you have to go pick up a book. You have to reach research things. You can't be part of this sort of thing and not actually do a bit of homework. I mean, those are the rules, right? Some of us have all been to school. <laughs> Some of us have gone to like post-secondary school. You know, we've had exams. You got to do your homework, and and it takes time. It takes effort. It it, it takes energy, and um, and some people are invested in that. And some people aren't. And um, you know. Do your thing. Uh, oh. uh, <laughs> um, all right, so I think we have time for one or two more, one or two audience questions, if anybody has any. If you could put your hand up. Um, all right, yeah, right here. question is about uh, healing and doing the work of activism which can be very painful and draining and yet needing to like maintain needing to take care of yourself in yeah, order to be able to keep doing it and so how do your question is how do I keep doing that um, I'm really bad at it let's just be honest I'm trying but now part of it is that the work itself is healing for me that only goes so far but it's true it gives me a reason to keep going it's its own form of energy and inspiration. Um, lately beyond that, I have taken to um, taking lots more pictures of flowers and <laughs> birds and having to go for a long walk so that I could find the flowers and the birds, yeah. right? And like um, hanging out with my friends on Sunday after my radio show and not paying attention to whatever might be going on in the world. Um, it means, uh, for some, for some of us, it can mean going to therapy. It can mean, I know that's not an accessible option for everybody, but it's, it can be an important one. You know, like, I think that the important thing is that we're always engaged in a communal process of healing and recognizing that, like, it's not just something that we need personally, it's actually something that has to be a gift towards, like, um, the whole community. So like when I kick it on Sunday night with people who do a lot of the same kind of work that I do and we just hang out, there's no pretenses, there's no explanations necessary, there's no nothing that, like we know. And that's a healing space for me. And I think we all have to try and find those healing spaces and find the people who are probably also suffering like us so that we can work through that together. Mm. <clears throat> I'm curious how you 
what you're what you do to heal. I'm curious to know. Yeah. The same question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do I do for healing? That's shit, I didn't know that was going to be such a deep question. <laughs> didn't know the question would be sent back to you. So deep. You answered it so easily and so quickly, man. Um, that's a good question. Thank you for bringing it back. I feel like for me, uh, healing um, is uh, speaking my feelings. And for such a long time, I feel like uh, I learned to suppress them. And now um, it's been a process of unlearning how to do that. And so speaking what I feel is something that has helped me to release all of that. Mm. And also, um, just like you as a filmmaker, I also love storytelling and narrating. And uh, hearing those stories and be able to find a way artistically to say them is also very healing. Creating is very healing. And so, funny enough, because now that I'm hearing myself, you're talking about community and just being in a space of community um, Hearing stories and telling stories is community, and I feel like it's happening. Right I'm now. connecting. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so thank you for asking me. And, yeah. and um, <laughs> as um, as also as an artist and as a storyteller, I can see how that process helps you to feel. Um, to feel that void that your community feels and our community feels, and also take, I'm a photographer, so I can see how fo taking photos is um, a process that helps you heal, and it's very peaceful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was gonna be clever and just say, well, you know, we got the Toronto Raptors. <laughs> <laughs> That's healing. Toronto, the Leafs, I'm a hockey fan, I gotta admit. Um, so I find that healing just escaping and watching those guys. It's true, it's honest. I mean, you have to find that great friends like Jake and like Dave and Ned and these people in my life that I can just get together. A lot of my friends are musicians and I find a lot of healing in music. And um, so just sitting in a studio when they're working and I'm just, just there while they're, they're doing their creative thing and just I can just I have like a live show while I'm writing and stuff. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but uh, but this is the healing, like right here, right now. Like what you that's what I was trying to be, you know, get out without saying it. But it's uh, having this room and, and people coming here and because you go through a journey to make something. And again, you don't. We only we know so much. We have instincts and, and uh, people who say that they know everything is like, it's whack, it's not true. <laughs> and it's, uh, so you're constantly, if you're seeking and trying to discover some things and you're, you're, you're not trying to tell yourself you know something, you're, look, you're, you're open. And, uh, and right now, just to have this engagement is like, it's, it's, I'll sleep better tonight. I probably will sleep, a little, maybe go to bed a little bit, probably not as early. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, maybe I'll go to bed earlier tonight. But it does, like, these moments help. So, yeah, it's, it's really good. All right, we have time for a few more questions. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. Can you stand up just for a second? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Right. Pretty much, um, in a nutshell, I was told that I wasn't black because I was small. Huh. So, um, I was, I was in eighth grade at the time. So, I was just trying to like learn like what it meant to be black. Or black. So, my question is, how do you navigate um, in our own like spaces, in our own movement, these like anti-Muslim, anti-queer, anti-cis, or anti-trans, sorry. That's what it's called. Like, you know, all these like, all of these little microaggressions that are happening like within our own, you know? So like how do we, how do we expand, like, you know, how do we address that? 
Lou, do you want to answer that one? Oh, okay. Um, I think uh, I think when you're addressing microaggressions within the Black community, um, whether whether that's homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, um, it's it's like what what Desmond was saying. It's you have to do the work. You have to continue to address it. You cannot back down because you think that you're going to be ostracized or you're going to be isolated because at the end of the day there's community for everybody we all have a community here we all have um it might be harder to find your community trust me i know um but i think it's i think it's just about it's not it's not about not being afraid but it's about facing your fears I'm curious, like, how do you respond to that, though? You're asking the question, but you went through the experience, and I know other people have, too, but, but what are you doing? How do you, when, when I know, but I, I know, I know that, but I'm saying you're posing a question, but what did you do? What did you do when you were in that scenario, when someone said to you, hey, man, you're not black, or you're from, what did you do? How did you respond? Also, like, shout out all our Somali people for Woo! real. Woo! Woo! Um, Cause I feel like from where I'm sitting, Somali people are going through some very particularly difficult things in this city right now and across the country. And that has to be named. And so for myself, um, so you mentioned allyship with the trans community, I'm cis. You mentioned allyship with the Muslim community, I'm Christian. Um, I am male, right? I think that when we're trying to support, one of the really important things that we can do that I'm trying to learn for myself is, instead of arguing with people from our own, not that experience perspective, we need to share the words and the ideas and the scholarship of the people who are experiencing it and who are already doing all the work and talking about it because we who have other platforms, like we don't have to reinvent something and we certainly don't want to erase people while we say that we're standing in solidarity with them. So I think it's very important. For example, I, I learned a really big lesson recently when um, that big conference happened in the United States for Muslim people, it was um, recently, last couple of months and um, there were a lot of Muslim leaders who were saying things that people who were in the black Muslim community felt were anti-black and so I follow a lot of these mostly black and Somali women on Twitter and I'm like okay this is not my experience but I'm just gonna sit here today and I'm gonna retweet everything that's being said about this conversation and I'm gonna share it with my networks so that they can hear from black Somali Muslim women how these intersections are working. You don't have to hear it from me, hear it from them. And I think that that's what we could do. Like, I don't understand why people don't share the work of Angela Davis and Audre Lorde when they're talking about, like, when somebody tries to step to you, just be like, have you read this brilliance by this person? Oh, no, you, ha you actually haven't? Why don't you go away and do some work, and then if you care enough to absorb this material, then we can have a conversation, right? Because... I didn't get to the place that I'm at by asking somebody on Twitter, what's it like to have the experiences of this marginalized group? And then having them tell me and being like, okay, word, thanks. You know? <laughs> 
you actually have to do the work. So I think that we should be recognizing that it's being done out there, and that we should, if we're not part of the groups that are struggling within these intersections, amplify their voices, amplify their words, amplify their work, um, so that they can take the place in this conversation that they need to. Uh, oh, did you have more? Oh, okay. I just wanted to comment on the meeting part. There's a free meeting uh, event directed at Black and Indigenous people that's happening next week. Next week, Friday. Where? Uh, Where? It's coming to the Women's Center, 745 Danforth Avenue. So it's practitioners coming in for Black and Indigenous people of color that provide um, training to volunteer, psychotherapy, massage therapy, wow. acupuncture, um, as well as energy healing and um, Reiki. If you're able to volunteer, we have people to volunteer your services. Let's say Newcomer Women's Center, it's 745 Dagwood Avenue. It's every last Friday of every month. Uh -huh. And it's on April 28th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for some more questions. One or two. Yes. Sir, in the back. No. In the middle? Oh, sorry, in the middle. My bad. Okay. Uh, Jasmine, I love. Charles great work, fantastic. Uh, you said something, Desmond, in the film about white supremacy being a problem, you know, and it needing to be named, and, and people being enslaved, enslaved. Who was doing the enslaving? And so, so you're talking about white people. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want you to expand on what you think the, the solution is. You know, like you talked about, like you have to name it, mm -hmm. but. Right. What what more? Like what what like is that it? Just talk about it more and that'll change things? <laughs> well my brother in Nova Scotia and Halifax talked about people getting out of their Bentley, right? So that he could get into it the Bentley. Um, that would be a good start. <laughs> I hope y'all don't think I'm playing either. I am not joking. I am not joking. It's called, re uh, thank you, it's called reparations. It's called justice. I am not joking. Um, but let me do what I just suggested and defer to the work of James Baldwin who already answered this question so that none of us ever need to go answering it again. Well, he, he gave us the answer that people need to go out and do the work of, which is, that um, white supremacy to me is a system that says whatever we conceive of whiteness to be, it's at the top. It's the ideal. And we as black people occupy a very specific space within a white supremacist hierarchy in that we're at the bottom. We're not mixed in with other groups of people. We are at the bottom. The words black and white and the oppositional function that they play in our language is not an accident. It's not just a coincidence that we got named the black people and y'all are the white people and that that's just some characterization. We're at the bottom. We make whiteness what it is by being at the bottom. So, James Baldwin said that people who benefit from white supremacy they need to figure it out for the damn selves. Because I did not decide that my last name would be erased so that it could be Cole or Hamilton or Davies or whatever other slave names Johnson are in my family. I didn't decide that. I didn't decide the immigration policy that says black people can come here from Jamaica as farm workers and break their backs picking our food and vegetables. I didn't make that rule. And the system that people in this country, but primarily white people, are benefiting from, but that rule still exists. They don't get citizenship. Yo, I don't, I don't want to go off because I know we don't have too much time. But like. <laughs> When, when are the white people who eat the vegetables gonna fight
for the people who pick and grow the vegetables. When are y'all gonna start being traitors to your own race and get on the right side of history? That's what I really wanna know, because I can't do it for you. I can't, yo, look what we do. Look, look, at, look at how hard we work just in order to be seen, right? Just in order to be visible. Yo, I'm doing as much as I can, my brother, but at some point, all the people, look, look at these idiots who are gonna meet at the police services board tomorrow. I'm going to debate once again whether carding is the right thing to do after Black Lives Matter Toronto slept outside the police station after all these things have happened and then they say, you know, when, when we get too loud and, and, and real for them, then they want to give us a concession or two. And you know what? You're right. Carding is wrong. But carding is still happening in the city of Toronto. So we slept outside the police station when Andrew Loco got killed. We blocked the Allen Expressway when Andrew Loco got killed. I'm gonna talk about this in a second. 25 years ago, we rioted up and down Young Street so that our people could have a future. Where were the rest of everybody else? Where were they and where are they now when we're putting our bodies and our lives on the line? Y'all are sitting around watching us. And so, the way forward is never as, I don't want to insult you, but what I'm saying is the way forward is not the mysterious riddle that people kind of claim that it is. We're doing the work every day, but the work is too terrifying for people, so they're begging us to find an easier way for them to get in. And I refuse. I, I just, I gotta do this because I brought it up, because we're talking about Young Street. Um, you guys need to save the date for this if you can because we're here at a documentary film screening and there's going to be a big, big film screening coming up. I'm pulling it up on Twitter right now. It is May 4th. May Oh, I already tweeted the shit out of this thing. <laughs> it's called It Takes a Riot. May 4th, Race, Rebellion, Reform, a documentary to mark the 25th anniversary of the Young Street Uprising and y'all need to go see that. So this brother who made this film, he hit me up about, uh, through Amanda Paris, he's, this brother lives in, in New York. He's an American who's coming to tell this story because he re recalls and, like how it influenced America, this riot that happened here in Toronto. No one's told a story here, right? So this brother who's, Jake and I just got, we've been helping him because he came up here to uh, make this film. He sat in while we were doing our, our post stuff. You met him in a quick second. But this is this brother who came up for, he, he's, a, he's an American. And he's telling the story about happening, that happened in Toronto that was, that affected him. And so anyway, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty powerful that that's community. Like that is, yeah. And I think on that note, we're going to wrap it up for the evening. Uh, I want to thank. Wait, oh. there was a brother there who had his hand up for a long time. I'm oh. really sorry. Can I? Can yeah, we sure. Just let's do that. Okay, let's do. Let's do it. You know, you did. Everybody in the room. Right? We get it. Way too much money off of us. 
Um, I would like to say, based on what you just said, that um, we cannot dismantle the systems of racism without dismantling the system of capitalism. Wow. Period. So, you know, we, there's no way to half-ass freedom. So if we want to do it, we have to accept that capitalism got to go. But we got to like, yeah, reshape that within ourselves. We got to make our, are there any young folk in here under the age of like cursing? <laughs> we got to make our fuck you money. I'm serious. We got to find our way to make our fuck you money. And that's the way that you can actually, you know, we're gonna be out here and be an activist and so on and so forth. I'm making a film with a woman in Cuba who fought and was part of the Black Panther Party, was part of the Black Liberation Army, and she's still sitting um, in Cuba on the FBI's most wanted list. She's the one who helped Asata to get there. Now, the thing to learn from this is that they had a method, and it was a certain time, and it was free love, there were drugs flowing, there's all kinds of things happening. It was just a time. Now, you know, as she's a, a now woman in her, in her, in her mid-60s, she, she's providing knowledge of living the experience and still in it. And no one really talks about Nahanda. And this is a, a, a you know, we're talking about feminist movements and, and uh, individuals who have stood out and done things. And um, <laughs> we just gotta do some more homework, man. And, and, and she says, the one thing is like, that, that it makes me laugh about this woman, she's like, you, I tell her about some opportunity that comes up or something like that, she goes, you know Charles, you gotta be political, but take that money. <laughs> She, I'm gonna see, because she actually understands that we have to infiltrate this capitalist system in our own way, and we have to not be robbing banks in order to fund our movements. That's something that they did, right? We're smart. We've got all kinds of resources. We can get a little startup going, and uh, and we can actually, you know, empower ourselves in all levels, on all levels, economically educationally, the way we heal. It's a lot, it's a long list, but, it's, uh, but I think we can do that because <laughs> we know that, uh, we know that, I mean, Jazz Cartier said something at the Junos, which was pretty awesome. Did anyone hear that? Yeah. Anyone catch that? So, you know, even in the reflection of, of these awards, this music that is Canadian, and at the after party when they're celebrating everybody in there, what's the music that they're playing that everyone's dancing to? What's the music that everyone's really like jiving to? It's not even the stuff that's even reflected on getting the awards, right? The DJs, the sort of so the vibe, like this thing, and um, and we and and anyway, but folks are making money and loot off of it, and um, and that's where it's like you know this project was a real eye-opening experience for myself dealing with broadcasters and bureaucracy and certain things and people having to. They want to do good, but they got to check themselves too in this process. And last thing I'll say is that, like, you know, I had to make a decision in doing this project if I was going to go out in the, in the field and pick the cotton and give the cotton to other people to make sweaters for their families and have no sweaters for us. So that's when my question about audience and who this film was for really became clear of why this film and this process and this whole thing needed to be done. Yeah, so, I don't know why I was looking at you like that so intensely. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's it. That's <laughs> Just real quick. So first of all, everybody, I hope that if you're not doing so already, you start following Lou and her incredible work also and making sure that we support all of our filmmakers who are doing creative things and who are doing storytelling. And um, I want to thank you a lot for the work that you do. Me too, thank you. Um, and it, going back to the question about the economic thing, this is why I bring up farm workers. This is the exact reason why. Because 
if we're fighting so that every single person who comes into Canada to work gets status immediately upon arrival, gets work benefits, gets a decent wage, because they are the most exploited people labor-wise in the country. Look what happened just now with the temporary foreign worker conversation a couple of years ago. Who, who was the target of all the anger? The workers who are the most abused and marginalized already in the society, most of whom are black and brown people. We're still angry at them because they're taking a job that we claim we want, even though we don't really fucking want that job. That's why it's being given to a migrant worker, because you don't want to do that picking tomatoes and break your back. You don't want to have all that dangerous farm equipment around you. You want somebody else to do it for you. When we actually start fighting to uplift those workers and to make sure that their floor is up here, that is going to benefit everybody. So it is ultimately about capitalism. It's ultimately about exposing the system that makes these divides and which perpetuates that the black people are always going to be on the end. Look what they're doing. The other day, they said that almost half of the kids in the Toronto District School Board, almost half of the kids in the Toronto District School Board who get suspended or expelled are black students. We're 8% of the youth population in Toronto. And we're almost half of the kids in the TDSB who get suspended. But they're selecting us out, these teachers and these administrators. And they will, they will sit there and they say, I don't know why it's happening. I don't understand. But then they'll really say, but maybe the black people are doing something to get themselves expelled and suspended. But they're pre-selecting us so that we can go and work in their car wash later. So that we don't get our education, so that we could go and work in their McDonald's. This is, this is the world that they're pre-selecting for us. And there will be others who are not black who are there to join us who also got kicked out of this system that nobody wanted. So we need economic solidarity as much as we need anything. That's why they went after Dr. King. It's not because of anything really. It's at the Vietnam War and talking about economic equality. That's why they killed our brother. They tell us all to be like him, but what happened to him? I always love how he gets fetishized every February, like, be more like him, and it's like, yo, you gotta yo. I mean, it, it's, it's so, like so, so we need to fight for economic justice, and uh, because you did mention Justin Trudeau earlier, Justin Trudeau thinks that his fairy tale of a country is gonna make people like myself and Charles here shut up, and yo, we need to go right after that guy's fantasy land of Canada, and we need to burst that Canada 150 bubble. I see all the stuff going up on the screen, guys, before, this, before the movie. I see it. I get it all. I'm sponsors, blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much for your money. Cool. But, but if you're paying me so that I can express myself, Canada 150? No, we're going to reinvent what Canada means, and we're going to start right now. And on that note, um, <laughs> I think that's going to be all for the... Can we get another round of applause for Charles and Desmond?